the way that Osevier works and the way that we train and assess people, I really view there are a lot of components when it comes to training surgeons, right? It's, it's, it's a complex task. But we can deal with complex tasks by, by breaking it down and make it relatively simple. So, you know, part of our inspiration at OSO is, you know, Dr. Gawande um, and kind of the checklist manifesto. And, and the way that Atul Gawande deals with the runaway complexity of modern medicine is checklist. And that's partially how we deal with, you know, in a way, the runaway complexity of modern surgery is, you know, check, setting up checklists or workflows. So that's one of the things that's actually completely unique about OSO is we have every single step of the procedure that we simulate from end to end. We don't just kind of focus on specific steps because a knee replacement might have like, you know, when you really break it down, like 150 steps or something like that. So you're just training on three or four of those steps. That's not, you know, as helpful as that is, there's a lot more to the procedure, even simple things you really need to know how to do. Mm -hmm. So what OSO VR is end to end assesses your knowledge of the steps and, and you all, it also checks when you're test mode it actually assesses that you remember the steps of what to do. You can pull them from memory. Now, the second part of how OSOVR works is making sure you do those steps well, something we call accuracy. And so this is a lot of what people think of when they're like, hey, like when you're training as a surgeon, like, you know, you need to make sure you get everything in the right spot and things like that, right? Um, and a lot of the times, you know, for especially if you're a fully trained surgeon, which is kind of actually our key user group that's who's using us the most often because that's where you you have the highest training burden of, of dealing with situations and procedures you haven't really seen a lot of before. Um, we, we, we tend to know how to do these things pretty well. It's more like just what are the steps to the specific procedure? Because at this point, you're like, you know, pretty much an advanced musician. You know all the notes. You just need to know how to string them together for this specific piece. Uh, so to speak. Um, but I'm going to show you that here. And then finally, efficiency, right? Like you, you have limited time in the operating room. Data tends to show that uh, the smoother a case or the more efficient a case, the better the outcome. So we, we just want to make sure people are moving smoothly uh, at a steady pace through these procedures. So I'm going to show you an example of our accuracy-based interaction. So, you know, what we're doing right now, there's the tibial shaft fracture here. And one of the first steps of this case is to basically determine where our implant is going to go in the bone. Um, outside of reducing the fracture, meaning, you know, lining up the bone or setting the bone, as some people would say, this is probably the most important part of the case. If the nail is improperly positioned, you are going to get deformity at the fracture site or some kind of issue in the joint or some kind of post-operative pain. So this is a very small wire, so you can reposition it multiple times, make sure the position is perfect. And then you will drill a hole around this wire, and that will determine where the implant goes in the bone. So I'll so show you kind of. We're, yeah, we're standing by the patient bed. You just what is it you picked up off the off the tray? So this is uh, like a drill or a driver, um, okay. battery operated, and then I have a guide wire loaded inside of it. Okay, great. And you're going to apply that. So it's to a the, sharp to the tipped knee. wire here. So as I'm tapping the bone here, I can actually feel it, which is really cool. Um, and so. Um, I'm just going to kind of like send it in like a wacky direction to kind of show you what not good looks like. So another thing is, you know, we have just sort of like little bonus flavor things. So if I'm exiting the bone here, I get a little like warning symbol uh, just mm -hmm. to kind of like help keep people in the guidelines, so to speak. So another really key skill um, is understanding how to interpret a 2D image and create a 3D mental model in your head. So you know, right now, this is obviously, ideally, you want this to be going right down the center of the bone. This is shooting out kind of what's called the lateral side of the bone. I would say probably if we look at a lateral here, I think this might look okay, actually. So, yeah, so if I was looking at this, this is shooting a little too posterior, and I'd want to go more anterior. But you can look at one of these images and think it looks fine. But if you don't check the other image, it actually could be in a wildly inappropriate location. So this is a very important skill for people to get down, even sometimes at advanced phases. But what we can do in VR is we can view things in 3D. And so we can kind of help, like, you know, if, if you were looking at this, you're like, what the heck am I looking at here? So hmm. now it makes a little more sense, right? I can, I'm actually pulling the bone out of the leg, yeah, and we can kind of see ideally where it should go versus where it's going right now. Yeah, the, the leg became transparent. You grab the bone you're holding in your left hand, and uh, you can just check it out. That's cool. That's great. So let's get a little feedback here. So once again, the the big issue here is really my angle. It's just it's uh, needs to go more medial by quite a bit. So 
um, now I have the opportunity to try again. Um, and I don't have to worry about injuring a patient or burning a cadaver or anything like that. So I can kind of throw this on here. That's looking pretty good. Um, shooting like a little lateral there, but I'll just take it for, oh, I love that. I'm a doctor. Okay. <laughs> So how how does this compare to actual? I mean, you've done actual actual reality surgery. How does this feel compared to that? Does it touch the same part of the brain? Does it? Does it, it? I assume it doesn't use the same sort of muscle memory or create the same sort of muscle memories that physical uh, physically picking up a tool, actually picking up a tool would do. What? Is, how do the two experiences contrast? Yeah, I think um you know uh, there's some things that are different and some things that are very similar. Um, you know. One of the challenges here in real life is, you know, you're pushing back against the skin. You actually kind of get that here. Your brain is, is um, um, kind of giving you that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think this, I'll, I'll start with the things that are similar because I think there are just more things similar than not. This, this idea of just, you know, I need to check, switch between two views, kind of understand where I'm at. And like, often you'll like be perfect on one view and then you'll go to the other one and be like, ah, oh, I'm off there. So you'll move there and then that'll move you off the other view and just, getting that skill down of like limiting your movements to a single plane that is that is very important and it really is is created quite well here um i think another thing that that's really cool is um you know just sort of how the the kind of methodology of, of how you do this so like initially the most important thing is you just want to start like you don't really care about the angle so much you just want to be on the right spot on the bone and so like okay let's say i'm happy there i'll drill in a little bit but then you want the angle to be perfect once you have your starting point. So I can drill in a little pilot hole and then I could kind of pivot around it and I'm locked mm -hmm. in. So that's also very true to life. Um, you even get like a little bit of skiving, which is, which is uh, kind of real too. A thing you're not going to get here is in real life. If you start drilling a bunch of holes in the bone and it's like Swiss cheese, you start running, the wire will get sucked into those holes, which can be an issue. And then, you know, there's a special way of like how to get around that. But that's something that you would know how to do if you're kind of at the point where typically our users would be at that you're, you're not getting here. So that's, that's like a very advanced thing. Um, but, but generally I would say that it's, you know, in terms of I can manipulate the CRM just like I could in real life, I can zoom, I can invert, I can move it wherever I need to. I can adjust this wire wherever I need to. It's, um, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty amazing tool. Like I wish I had this in residency because you know, what, what, what is challenging for us is, is kind of, especially as you're doing this like around, uh, you know, the knee is kind of like a good starting point for people because it's very superficial. You could see the bone, like where you're actually mm -hmm. going most times. But when you're doing this for hip fractures, um, you know, it, it's every implant, the guide wire will go in a different location. It's very deep, so you can't really see where it's going. So it's very field-based and x-ray based. And to, if I had had a tool like this, I think I would have been much more prepared to, you know, even understanding where the C-arm needs to be positioned relative to the patient can sometimes be a challenge when you're juggling all these different procedures. Um, so it's it's hard for me, at least for this particular step, to point out things that I guess are not directly translatable because I, I think mm -hmm. this works particularly well um, for, for teaching the things that you need to teach. I would say, you know, probably, like I said, the, the issue of repeated holes and you know, maybe for certain certain kinds of guy wire placement, not this, I don't think, but, you know, it's some of the physics of how the pin meets the bone, but I do think this stimulates that pretty well as well. And and you are getting haptic feedback too. So it kind of checks all the boxes. As an experienced user, most of this, most of your users are experienced surgeons. What do they get out of this? It's just a refresher or a reminder, or are they, are they learning new procedures? Uh, for, I can understand the appeal for residents. You could work on this before actually working on a physical body, an actual body. But what does this give to an experienced surgeon? So I think, you know, especially for, like I said, the, the sort of early career surgeon who has recently mm -hmm. finished their formal training. So they finished residency, finished fellowship. So they're, they're basically like fully proficient in all these things. But what becomes a challenge for them is they're like, okay, I need to offer these different procedures as part of my practice but there are like a thousand different ways to do all of them. So which one of these am I going to do? So there, there are two key challenges. The first is uh, I call it technique or procedure exploration. Like what are even the options? 
because you're not going to get a full exposure to it in your training. So for example, in my training, I never did a single robotic procedure. I never did minimally invasive spine surgery. Uh, I never did a unicondylar knee replacement. Does that give you an hmm. idea of like, these yeah, are yeah. things that are relatively standard, but it's there's so much that you're just not going to be able to get a view into it all. So you don't even know what it is in the first place. So that's the idea of technology or procedural exploration. And it's, it's a combination of you trying different things and your patients also coming asking for certain things too. It's like, what's in demand in your area? What are other people offering? How do you differentiate from people in your practice or across the street at the competitive hospital? Now, once you pick the procedures that you want to incorporate into your practice, you need to master them. Ideally before operating on patients, but that's not, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a hybrid system right now, right? We're practicing on people a little bit. Um, and so the, the next component is like, okay, well, I need to get my reps in. Without OSO, it's, you know, you go to as many courses as you can, but often, you know, most people go to one, maybe you could go to a couple or do a local training if you're lucky. Um, but here, you know, with OSO, you can practice multiple times as much as you need to, and then get that in-person uh, kind of final polish like we discussed. And so that's really um, how early career surgeons are using this. And they already know, like they know how the guide wire works. They know all the things that I brought up. They just need to understand what are the steps and sort of the specifics to this device system. I would say even if you're talking like very advanced, like high volume surgeons who are like, you know, we would call like the masters in our field, this is a very powerful tool as well because these are surgeons who probably at that point in their career don't even need to get hands-on with the real system. They, and they've operated so much, they're so good at these procedures that they can run through a new technique or a new device in VR and probably have a good enough sense to be able to bring that almost directly to a patient because they're, they're kind of that far along uh, in mm -hmm. their career. So who are your primary customers? Who are you selling to now? So we mainly work with the medical device industry since all of these newer procedures involve some kind of device or enabling technology. And the when we get trained, when I'm talking about, hey, I want to learn about how to do this newer surgery, new procedure, minimally invasive, I'm, I'm not doing that through my hospital. I'm doing that through a medical device company. So like Johnson right. & Johnson, Smith & Nephew, Stryker. And so those are our customers. We work with them. We bring their procedures into OsoVR, and then their customers utilize OsoVR as part of their educational journey. And you, you mentioned that orthopedics is sort of a great place to start with this. What are your intentions going forward? Is, does this sort of technology, does this platform allow for simulation in other specialties of other surgeries, even soft tissue surgery? Yeah, that's a great question. We, we view OsoVR as universal simulation platform. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've already moved beyond orthopedics, although it's still a major focus for us. Um, but, you know, we are in spine, which you know, some people consider that separate from orthopedics. Um, we're in the cardiac space doing things like electrophysiology, uh, structural heart. Um, we're in the interventional or endovascular space okay. and doing things like uh, aortic valve, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, abdominal aortic nerve repair, uh, as an example. Um, we are plastic surgery. Is we're in the gastroenterology, urology space. So we're really moving beyond just orthopedics. And the vision that I have is that there are, you know, you can look at different estimates, but maybe like 20 to 30 million healthcare professionals who are doing procedures with patients. And that could be anything in my eyes from putting in an IV or central line or doing complex robotic surgery. And just in the ease of how you and I are jumping in to VR together, I want every single one of them to be able to jump into OsoVR to train and assess themselves on whatever procedure they're doing at any time to potentially improve their performance from 230 to 300% um, and just make, making sure that no matter who the patient is, wherever the patient is, they're always receiving most optimal procedure with the most optimum proficiency from the team universally. And that's, that's kind of the dream and the vision. Very cool. Well, I'm, one thing, I've lost track of time. Wow, we've been talking for a long time. <laughs> like I'm you get time casino. dilation in VR. It's, yeah, you we're putting a clock in the, the next version. That's a good an issue. I just wanted to take a quick walk over to the uh, table with the skull and the heart and just sort of yeah, show that. Yeah, let's head over there. All right. All right. A little closer, maybe. Boom. All right. So these these are here just for uh, 
to sort of demonstrate what's possible, or do they have a function over there as well? Uh, I'd say, I yeah, should, more what's possible. We have a trade either, table either with, with the, I'm sorry, we have a trade table with a brain, a skull, for those in the podcast, uh, I'm sorry, a skull, a brain, and a, a beating heart, which is very, very cool. So go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, speaking of how we're expanding beyond orthopedics, like, I mean, I don't even know what this bone is. This is beyond my specialty. But, um, <laughs> you know, we are in the um, kind of interventional uh, uh, neuro space, as I said, the cardiac space before. And, you know, just the the level of detail, once again, it's just it's people are not used to seeing something like this um, just really in any medium. And the technical achievement here that's important to point out is not just the fidelity, which I think kind of speaks for itself, and the sound is also really cool, but it's <laughs> right now we're using, hold on, I'm just like listening to it, so cool. We are, we are using relatively low-powered standalone VR headset, so it is actually much harder to get something running smoothly in this headset than the older, what's called tethered VR, where you're wired to a computer. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting is we're able to get a level of fidelity people have never seen in VR before, but also on standalone headsets running smoothly. You can move your head side to side and running buttery smooth. And we're doing that at scale across hundreds of modules. And so that's the technical accomplishment of Oso VR is, is the ability to get this level of fidelity running smoothly on standalone VR at scale consistently. And something we're extremely proud of. And I mean, just, you know, looking at the different foramen and fossa of the skull here is just, uh, it's, it's, I don't know how many skulls you've looked at, but this is incredibly this is realistic. My first. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just amazed at how, when I put it down on the tray, there's rolling, rolling off. <laughs> it doesn't just snap back into place. It's actually for at least 10 seconds. It seems to be actually holding the properties of the object that it is. You put the heart down and it, if you don't put it down just right, it'll kind of almost roll off the table. Yeah. That, that was an issue in my, cardiac pathology lab in med school. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to have that represented here. Well, this has been very cool. I mean, am I missing any uh, critical points? Uh, I, I, again, I've lost track of time. Normally I try to keep this to a half hour, but uh, clearly I a think place I, you want to spend you know, time. I just ask you, how do you feel in here? Like, uh, you know, I'm saying a lot about the feeling and how everything looks and how important that is, but I'm curious what your experience is. I feel very comfortable. I think the space, as we described, it's very clean and open and, and almost space age, but more personally as an experience, this is definitely a more, um, more stimulating than a Zoom call for sure. And it's, it's definitely not as stimulating as an in-person. So it definitely is that in-between between teleconferencing and, and in-person, but I feel more engaged. I mean, I'm, I've spent the entire time looking at you in the eyes, even though, you know, you really can't see me, I've been smiling the whole time, and you can't see a face. <laughs> I haven't quite figured out what to do with my hands. I think I held them up for most of the hour, and my arms are going to get tired. I'm like, why don't, I, why don't I put these down? But for some reason, I'm geared to here. But it definitely is it's, – it's, it's, it's a different reality than what we actually live in, and it's a place where I, I could see it being very conducive to training and learning and, and a place you want to return to. And I will give you the headsets back. I should have spoken about that. <laughs> but, it's, but it's cool. It's very, very – well, it's amazing, Tom. I, I really appreciate being on the show, and even more virtually than than usual. And you know, <laughs> thank you for all the work you do in our space and all the coverage. Uh, I get a lot of my information and insight from you, and uh, just for your long term support and belief in the company. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us on the podcast and for opening your your operating room to us. You're welcome anytime.